everybody, Chris Harry with you on a new episode of Chargers Weekly. Coming up, we're going to spin around the league and get an early forecast on the AFC with NFL Network's Omar Ruiz. But first, we'll learn more about the Chargers' fifth-round selection, Easton Stick, through a pair of gentlemen who know the quarterback best. North Dakota State head coach Matt Entz will join me in a bit. Leading off, though, is new Kansas State head coach Chris Kleiman. All right, it's my pleasure to welcome in the head coach of Kansas State, Chris Kleiman, to Chargers Weekly. And Coach, I appreciate you joining me, and a very belated congrats on the new position in Manhattan. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me. Well, Coach, five seasons at North Dakota State, you went 69-6, and six, four FCS national championships, just an unbelievable run. And 49 of those 69 wins came with Easton Stick under center, and he was selected by the Chargers, fifth round, and his center, Tanner Volson, also with the Chargers, he agreed to terms after the draft. What was it like to see two former All-Americans uh, have their NFL dreams come true on the same team? Uh, that was really cool. I was so happy for, for both those guys and a number of other guys from that uh, championship team that uh, were able to sign contracts. But uh, for those two kids that, that know each other so well, Easton and Tanner, and, and really well when you think it's a quarterback and a center of all the time that they spent together on the field in the practice or in the meeting room and uh, in the locker room and stuff, I was so excited for those guys to, to have an opportunity to fulfill a dream and, and play NFL football. Well, Coach, let's just start on the field with Easton. Uh, What are the Chargers getting with Easton on the field? Uh, Probably the smartest guy I've ever been around, Uh, and I coach Carson Wentz uh, as well. And so that's a big thing to say uh, because Carson, I think, is is probably as cerebral as Easton, but Carson taught Easton everything that he knows, and Easton's a guy that uh, uh, on the field is going to make great decisions, He's going to understand uh, defenses really well. He's a he's a real student of the game, a real sponge, a guy that wants to know not only the whys, the hows, and everything else, but uh, uh, he wants to be a step ahead of everybody. And, and uh, I've never seen a guy prepare uh, for practices, prepare for games, prepare on a game plan sheet and a call sheet as well as Easton Stick. And once again, he learned all that stuff from Carson when he was Carson's understudy, uh, but he took it to another level. And uh, uh, watching that kid prepare Monday through Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, is un- unlike anything I've ever seen. And so I knew somebody was going to take a chance on him. Uh, he's not six foot six like Carson is, but somebody was going to take a chance on him. And he, you're getting a guy that's going to be an unbelievable competitor, a great winner, uh, and make everybody around him better. That's fantastic. Take me back to the moment when it clicked for you that you knew you were going to be able to win big with Easton. Well, we had uh, obviously it was a year that uh, Carson Wentz got injured, and uh, Easton was uh, the redshirt freshman that hadn't played any snaps, and um, we simplified some of the game plan for uh, for him, uh, and we had to go on a two game road trip, and um, he executed everything flawless, flawlessly, and was uh, a guy that uh, was an unbelievable leader, not only in the huddle but in the locker room at the practice field, and there was a kid that was 19 years old that had not played any snaps, and. He just galvanized everybody around him uh, to, to go through it and play with him. And, and uh, uh, after that, knew that um, he was in for a special career. Obviously, Carson came back and played in that championship game. And what it, it tells you everything you need to know about Easton Stick. Easton was 8-0, uh, had led us to the national championship game in 2015. Carson had played six games and broke his, his uh, thumb of that year but was cleared to play in the national championship game. And, and Easton uh, was the one that came to us and said, this is Carson's football team. Wow. Uh, he need, he deserves to play in this national championship game. I'll have an opportunity. And fair enough, Carson played in that game. And, and, and those two have been best of friends. Uh, Easton was in Carson's wedding and stuff. And I knew uh, for the next three years, uh, we were really going to be in great shape with, with Easton. And it was 49 football games. A lot of people don't even play close to that many in college, and he's in 49 football games. It's hard to believe. And you've mentioned kind of the similarities in, in some fashions with Carson Wentz. What other characteristics or, or traits do they share that you think translates so well to the NFL outside the intelligence that you, that you mentioned at the top? Well, the fact that they're coming from a pro style offense where you had a long huddle call, you had to, um, you know, have a wristband where you had a long, long call. You had to call it out 
uh, in the huddle. You had the ability to change plays at the line of scrimmage to get yourself uh, in the best play possible to change protections. Uh, and then the other thing is, and I know it's not going to be to the extent he did it at North Dakota State, but his athleticism in and out of the pocket and keeping his eyes downfield. Um, you know, he, he was able to scramble around and make a lot of plays running the football for us, but he made as many plays scrambling around and keeping his eyes downfield. He made a great play in the national championship game on a third, and I think it was eight in the red zone of scrambling around, keeping his eyes downfield and finding our receiver for a touchdown in a critical time. And those are things that uh, I know in, in watching limited amount of NFL football that I, like I do because of my job, uh, but it's the guys that can extend plays. Uh, and, and I think people have seen that with Carson already, his ability to extend plays that he's done, and, and Easton's the same way, his ability to extend plays with his legs and keep his eyes downfield. And it's not something, you know, you look at his, his rushing yards too, Coach, over 2,500 rushing yards and, and 41 rushing touchdowns. But it's not like he looks to run first, too, to your point about just extending plays. Uh, he'll look to find the open man, and then if he has to run, he'll make sure he does it. Absolutely. And, and what's the game situation? If it's first and 10 in the first quarter, he's going to be smart. If it's uh, third and four in the fourth quarter, uh, he's going to make the play to make sure that we keep moving the chains and give ourselves an opportunity to win. He understands game situations and game management really well of, of when are your times. I mean, in the semifinal game that we played this year, we had three of our running backs hurt, and I told him, I said, you're going to be the best running back we have today. I think he carried the thing over 20 times for a uh, hundred and a half or so yards, and, and that was what he had to do. He was going to do everything – possible to give his teammates a chance to be successful and win you know the person in many respects is just important as the player and you kind of alluded to it with his selflessness w- what is Easton like off the field coach uh he's a he's a, a great competitor uh but a guy that is going to make everybody around him better he's a guy that galvanizes a room when he comes in He's going to go visit cancer patients. He's going to go uh, visit underprivileged kids. He's going to work the Special Olympics. Uh, he's going to go uh, and, and do any community service project that uh, needs to be done to give back to the community. He, he knows that he's on a platform, and, and the good Lord put him on a platform to, to share what, what his knowledge is, and, and he loves doing that. I, I've been around him for five years, and the fact that I recruited him and had him as his red shirt year and then had him for his years playing. And I just can't think of a better person uh, to represent uh, his family, represent North Dakota State football, what, what he'll do in representing the Chargers in the, in, the, in the right way off the field. Man, we can't wait to welcome him. And Coach, he, hasn't, he couldn't have been drafted to a better situation when you talk about having a Hall of Famer in the room in Phillip Rivers. How impactful do you think that's going to be on Easton's career just right off the beginning to kind of share – a room with rivers yeah and he'll be a sponge and he'll he'll want to learn as much as he can and and uh he won't be a a, an arrogant egotistical cocky guy he'll be a guy that will know his place and say what can i learn how much can i gain from from being around philip rivers and and i know he's so excited i talked to him just the other night how thrilled he was to get out there just to get around him and, and, and meet Philip and, and, and learn from him and pick his brain. Yeah, and Philip said the other day that, that he's going to be a great addition to the room. Uh, let's talk about Tanner. He played in 58 games. He was just as big a part of that success up there at North Dakota State. Uh, what are the charges getting at Tanner as, as rookie minicamp starts this weekend? Uh, a, a really tough, physical, um, great football player that uh, understands the game really well. He had to make all of our calls as a center. Uh, he's got really light feet. Um, he uses his hands really well. You get around him and shake his hand. He's got, you know, he's a farm kid that's got really, really strong hands and, uh, grips you and he's hard to get away from. And uh, <laughs> a guy that, uh, uh, pretty unassuming, uh, when you look at him and, and see him moving around and all of a sudden you get him on the football field and put the pads on and, and, and a, and a different guy comes out that, uh, is a really, uh, emotional, uh, really, uh, energetic, uh, physical kid that, uh, will, uh, give himself a great opportunity to make that club you know again we talk about fit with Easton and Phillip to have a pro bowler in Mike Pouncey here who is one of the leaders on this football team at that position again a a great situation for Tanner oh really good and and Tanner wants to learn he's a sponge and uh and same thing he's coming from a pro style offense so 
uh, he's he's done a lot of the things that uh, uh, are already in, in place there within the Chargers organization as far as play calling and and doing things. And so um, I think that would give him a leg up too as far as understanding the pro style offense. And and I look forward to seeing how he does out there during the uh, mini camps. Yeah, and and this is the the start of their NFL careers really this weekend. Uh, final thing for you, just a, a message for the guys as they embark on a, a brand new journey at the next level. Well, just attack the process and uh, attack every day that uh, they have out, out there for their opportunity. Uh, learn, be a great teammate, be a great leader, uh, do what they've done to be successful. That's great work ethic with great character, high integrity guys that uh, are going to fit within that organization and they're going to make an impact on a daily basis. Kansas State head coach Chris Kleiman. Coach, I know how busy you are. I can't thank you enough for your time just to spend a few minutes and, and discuss your former guys. And we wish you the best of luck this fall in Manhattan. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, we now bring on the North Dakota State head coach, Matt Entz to Chargers Weekly. Coach, thanks so much for spending some time. How you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you guys having me on tonight. Well, first, how have Bison fans reacted to two of their All-Americans joining the Chargers? Well, I think it, 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 they're, they're super excited right now. You just hear a buzz. And uh, uh, we, we had a former Bison who had some success out in L.A. with the Chargers. And, and I think our fan base are, are, are excited to know that they're, uh, they're heading out there, uh, having Gus Bradley be a Charger. Uh, there's a there's a Bison connection out there, and so I see, uh, or I think a lot of our fans really really uh, are excited to know that those guys are going to a class classy organization like the LA Chargers. Yeah, the the Chargers, as you said, no stranger to Bison here. You got Gus is the defensive coordinator. Kyle Emanuel recently retired, another uh, a former Bison. And coach, when you were defensive coordinator, he won the Buck Buchanan Award, right, as a defensive player of the year, 2014. He did. He did. Uh, you know, outstanding defensive player. And uh, if my memory serves me correct, I want to say he had what well, had to be uh, 20, 21 sacks that year. And uh, Kyle was an unbelievable player for us. And uh, you talk about the epitome of what a Bison's supposed to be. And uh, we still use him uh, on our effort clips and, and, and things like that that we try to show the incoming uh, players that this is how you're supposed to practice. This is how you go about your work. And this is how you practice like a pro. And, uh, and Kyle was a super special young man to work with. And, and uh, even in retirement, we'll, we'll continue to have successes. You know, Gus Bradley, a former defensive coordinator at North Dakota State himself, what has he meant to the program? I, I want to get into Easton and Tanner, but just, you know, Gus, he's got an infectious personality. He's had so much success in the NFL. Coming from North Dakota State, uh, what does he uh, mean to you in the program personally? Well, you know, my first uh, couple times of of getting the chance to know uh, Coach Bradley have been when he came back and visited with the team and talked about what he felt like Bison Pride was and and some of the things that uh, make this program at NDSU so special. And so uh, I've used him as a resource more for the history of the program, uh, Gus being the defensive coordinator here, you know, a number of years ago, and then having been a player here, he has a, a great insight to uh, to what makes this place go and, and why it's so special. And uh, I've, I've been able to bounce ideas off him, been able to, to ask him some questions. And uh, he's been a great resource for me, not just as a, as a head coach, but as a defensive coordinator as well. And uh, uh, anytime you know you can have a, uh, a coach from the NFL come in and speak to your team, uh, he may be just repeating the things that you've been trying to discuss, but, but having that NFL shield on his, on his, on his clothing, uh, you know, bring some credibility, and our kids immediately want to listen and see what he has to say. And listen, I, I know Easton and Tanner are on the offensive side of the ball, but uh, I have a sneaky suspicion Gus will probably take him under uh, his wing as well, right? <laughs> I'm sure he will. You know, once a bison, always a bison, and I know those guys will, will have a great relationship out there in Los Angeles. No doubt. Well, Coach, I had an opportunity to talk to Chris Kleiman earlier today to get his perspective on Easton. As the defensive coordinator last year, you probably have a ton to share about just matching up with him in practice. Well, I do. Uh, but, you know, probably first and foremost, my first experience with Easton came probably in 2014 as well, but when he was the scout team quarterback. And to see how he prepared 
week in and week out as the scout team quarterback was was unbelievable. Uh, Easton was one of those guys. He knew the password to get into my computer and watch film probably better than I did at the time. <laughs> uh, he was always in there trying to emulate, trying to 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 get the the communication, the cadence down for the visit, for the opponent that week, and 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 learning a whole bunch of football along the way. And he'd, he'd look at every cut up I'd have prepared for him, and 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 one of the other unique things that I always tell people when they ask, you know about his ability back in 2014 we started to have to do the, the rpos became kind of uh, they started to become a trend in college football mm-hmm. and easton at practice would have two footballs in his hands he, he'd receive one from the center have another one he'd ride the the run fake and then throw the throw the pass rpo off it and you know not every scout team quarterback can do that for you but that's about the time when, when myself and our defensive staff realized that you know what, this young man's pretty special and going to be a really good player down the road. He just continued to develop over the course of time. What's the biggest trait? Uh, Coach Klein has said his intelligence just off the charts. Uh, what's the biggest trait that you think will benefit him most in the pros? Well, I, I, would, I would second that, but I think his work ethic as well. He'll be the first one in and the last one out. Uh, he, he, I would, you know, he's, he's the equivalent of a gym rat right now. And he's going to be that for the Chargers. He is going to be in there watching film and, and, and doing and, and crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. It doesn't matter if, if he's the starting quarterback or the backup. He's going to have a great grasp of the offense in, in Los Angeles. And, and, and he's going to make sure that he puts the time in because he's just a, that's just the way he's built and, and how he operates. He is a detailed, uh, oriented individual. And, you know, again, just like Coach Kleiman had said, his, his, his intelligence and his football smarts are out of this world. And there's a guy here entering his 16th year in the league, probably going to be wearing a gold jacket when it's all said and done, to, to share a quarterback's room with Phillip Rivers. You know, we already know yep. the intelligence of an Easton stick. To, to have a guy like that in his corner, uh, it, it comes down to fit sometimes when you get drafted. Sometimes you get drafted into a situation where uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to succeed. But, but to have a guy like that, what's that going to mean, Coach? Well, I think Easton's going to hang off every word that 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 Philip gives him, and is going to be a uh, you know a sponge for the for however long he needs to. He's going to try to absorb as much information, as much experiences that 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 Philip is going to share with him. Easton's going to take all that in. So when he does have his opportunity or his moment that he's going to be on the field, he's going to feel as 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 prepared as any quarterback in the in the NFL at that time. Tanner Volson, the center, uh, had a lot of success with Easton, and it's it's really cool that they come into this whole experience together. Uh, what was it like working against uh, Tanner in practice? Well, t- Tanner's the epitome of of you know of what an offensive lineman should be like, and especially at a place like North Dakota State, where it, it's more of a you know a pro style offense and. Tanner's going to be the guy that IDs the mic and 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 gets us you know gets the communication part of the offensive line rolling and uh, he did such an outstanding job and and it's it's it is unique that uh, uh, you know Easton and, and his center are going to be in LA together uh, all the new things going on at least the 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 one constant will be quarterback center exchanges are going to be somewhat familiar when those <laughs> two are working together but uh, uh, Tanner is a tough physical kid. Unbelievably strong, but you know he, he comes from a you know Drake, North Dakota, not the biggest town in the world. Probably graduated with about twenty kids, uh, but he he's he's North Dakota tough and is going to do an unbelievable job and and super bright. He's gonna he's gonna pick things up quickly and and the one thing I will say he is extremely athletic for as big and physical a kid as he is. And he comes from a program, coach. It really is mind boggling. You win four national championships. In five years, uh, as you were the defensive coordinator, you were coordinator of the year last year. What is it about North Dakota State that prepares guys for the next level? You know, whether it be the NFL or just life in general. Well, I think it's the it's the it's kind of a, the the words we use around here. It's the process and getting our kids to buy into how we go about our our weekly routines, our monthly routines seasonal and yearly uh, they don't deviate much and i don't think probably our plan of preparation isn't much different than maybe what gus's were when he was the defensive coordinator here um but there's a there's a reason and, and, a, and a rhyme to why we do everything and our kids buy into that they know exactly 
what to do. Um, they become extremely prepared uh, in, in in the game plans. They become extremely prepared out of season. Uh, our strength staff does an unbelievable job. Um, but the one thing that the constant I think that we're always talking about with in in recruiting is is we always try to find the kid. Everyone loves to play game day. Everyone wants to be the guy on game day. We try to find the players that want to be the guy the other 350 days. Mm. They want to excel on the days that it's just a, just it's just weight room today. But are you going to be the very best? It's just hey, we got workouts today. I'm going to be the very best. And, and you know we we don't want me and I and my guys. We're looking for ours, us, and we um, guys who are going to buy into a system, buy into a belief. And, and I think we've done a great job of that over the course of of, of decades uh, going all the way back to 1965 and the first national championship well it sounds like Easton and Tanner are going to fit in just fine in this locker room I wanted to ask you about the Chargers second round pick another FCS guy Nazir Adderley I know that you guys played Delaware last year what are your initial thoughts on on Nazir you know what you saw at Delaware and and how his game can translate to the NFL you know, being on the defensive side, I probably didn't watch him a whole bunch uh, a year ago at this time, and uh, I'm I'm always concerned about the next play for us or yeah. making the appropriate adjustments. So um, I do know this, having talked to some of our offensive guys, he was a young man that that before we ever played him, we knew that we were going to have to account for uh, a guy who could come downhill and, and and stroke you in the run game, but but also you know, had excellent cover skills and, and, and did some nice things having gone back and looked at that game. Once I saw that they took him in the second round, it is, it is cool to see another FCS player taken, especially one that you got a chance to compete against that year. But, you know, I think his, he's going to have a, he's going to have a smooth transition into NFL football. Uh, Delaware is an outstanding football program. They do a great job of preparing their kids and, and have a great tradition out there. Final thing for you, Coach, uh, a big weekend for these guys. Uh, do you have a message you want to pass along as, as they really start uh, a new journey in their life? Well, you know, I think the, the, the biggest message that, that, that I could give these two is keep doing the things that have got you here. Uh, continue to be you. Uh, you know, the work ethic, the effort, the time that these guys have put into perfecting their craft is, is, has allowed them uh, an opportunity in the NFL, and, and, and I hope they keep following the the – the recipe that's got them this far. So they're both unbelievable people. Uh, and I know they're going to work as hard as they can for the Los Angeles Chargers. Excited to get to know these guys. Uh, Matt Entz, the head coach of North Dakota State. Coach, congrats on the new role and, and best of luck to you guys up there. And just know you got some bison here and uh, we're, we're excited. Awesome. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, you believe this, you, you probably got a lot of new Charger fans out here and uh, in the upper Midwest, uh, you know, our, our fans love to see our guys be successful in the NFL and, and with Gus and, and, and Kyle having retired, but you, you still have some, so a, a ton of, a ton of fans. And so we'll be following you guys closely. Love it. Thank you so much, coach. You bet. Take care. Have a great night. All right. Now on the line, good friend of the podcast, NFL Network's Omar Ruiz joins me here on Chargers Weekly. And Omar, second week of May, it slowed down a little bit, but but the NFL never really sleeps. How are you, man? Hey, I'm good, Chris. Yeah, the the off season truly is a myth. Um, you know, and, and like we were talking, it's always a joy to visit with you uh, in person in Costa Mesa. But you know, it's, it's always a pleasure as well over the phone. So I'm glad to, to be here and. Uh, Good to catch up with you. Well, you've been all over the place. Uh, I've seen you here at Costa Mesa. I saw you in Arizona for the draft. W- what has this last month just been like for you personally? Well, it's been busy. I mean, really, it's it's the off season. It's it's the preseason. It's the regular season. And and like we said, you know, the, the off season really is a myth because once the Super Bowl ends, and you know, you you take a little downtime right there in February, then it's then it's draft season. And that has taken on a life of its own. So going through the combine and all the pro days and, um, you know, free agency is thrown in that mix. And then it all culminates with the draft and the importance that that has become for teams throughout the years and, and what it's meant now to the league in terms of a television event. We saw, you know, the ratings going through the roof this year, all time highs. And, and even the fan turnout in Nashville, the, the destination event itself, um, becoming more and more popular. So, so, you know, and now that everything has, 
has fallen into place. The dust has settled. Now the focus is back on the football field. Like we saw, I saw you in Costa Mesa last week, you know, the chargers getting back and, and getting on to work and, and the teams really will push forward through now to, uh, you know, that little break at the beginning of July. And, and then before you know it, training camp will be here. So it's been, you know, one busy season after the other. It's just, you know, what, what, uh, part of the NFL calendar we're talking about. Exactly, and, and rookie minicamp for the Chargers, uh, along with a, a number of teams, uh, commences this weekend. I want to go back to the draft because you were kind of at the epicenter of the drama in, in Arizona. What was it like to cover that, knowing that you know the Cardinals didn't make it known that they were going to draft Kyla Murray? I think a lot of people suspected it, but just to be in an environment where typically you know – what a team is going to do at number one overall. It, it really kind of set the tone for just a wild weekend, Omar. Yeah, it was just so multifaceted, yeah. that, that draft and the storylines there for Arizona. Number one, you had the intrigue of Cliff Kingsbury and the new coach and bringing his system in, which Kyler Murray seemed to be tailor-made for. And the the rumors that came out of the Combine week that it was all but a lock for Kyler Murray to go to the Cardinals at one, but for the Cardinals to not confirm that at any time before Thursday night at five o'clock Pacific, uh, when the draft got underway was just remarkable in its own right. That's right. Um, given that I was in Cleveland last year and, and, you know, at some point during the week, even though it was a surprise, we did know that it was going to be maker ba- Baker Mayfield before uh, Roger Goodell announced it. Not so this year, even though we had long thought it was going to be Murray. So there was that. And then two, the intrigue of why they didn't confirm it so they could officially put Josh Rosen on the market and and deal with him the, the way that they eventually did in, in that trade to Miami. So you had all that circulating that week. And, and it really was fascinating for a team that, you know, was coming off um, you know, obviously a disappointing year, but with still some, you know, future Hall of Famers on the roster and, and prospects for a quick turnaround. Um, it was just fascinating to see all, all that unfold in more ways than one. Yeah, certainly just because the smoke screens that we see throughout draft season, too, it's like you're thinking in the back of your mind, maybe this Kyler Murray thing is just the ultimate smoke screen, but obviously it wasn't. Um, what else surprised you during draft weekend, Omar? A lot of stuff happened. You mentioned Rosen going to Miami. Uh, the Raiders had a lot of picks. Did anything stand out to you in, in the surprise department? Well, I think that how they, the Raiders were able to disguise Farrell um, going at number four, you know, somebody who wasn't on anybody's radar and, you know, as far as a top five prospect and, and to pick him um, at the very near top of the draft. Um, I think that was surprising. And, and, you know, for Mike Mayock to, you know, leave the media world and, and not, you know, have that leak out in any way. And we, we've heard the story about sending the scouts home and, and maybe, you know, not knowing who to trust there in his first year as general manager um, and how everything unfolded in Alameda was maybe a little bit surprising to me. But I think when it, when it was all said and done, they did very well, and the Raiders certainly improved their roster on paper anyway that weekend. But, but the move and the secrecy with which the Raiders operated, I think that was you know, a big-picture surprise. Yeah, the Chargers, they get five defensive players, two offensive players, but it, it looks like those first two picks, Jerry Tillery from Notre Dame, Nazir Adderley, the safety from Delaware, those guys could be potential starters on a defense that has a lot of pro bowlers and, and all pros already. Uh, How did you think the Chargers did, specifically early, getting two defenders to add to that defense? Well, I love those picks, and I think the way Tom Telesco and and, and the personnel group have – develop this roster and 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 cultivated it you allow for a guy like jerry tillery to come in in a front line that already has joey bosa and melvin ingram and brandon mebane and justin jones so now he can slide right in and of course the expectations are still high for a first round pick but he still is allowed that developmental time because he has so many great players around him as well so he can really you know, be in position to thrive. And same thing goes for Nasir Adderley. I think he fits in perfectly with that secondary, the Jack boys that, you know, they've, they've come to know themselves as. He has those great ball skills and really reminds me of a, a bigger version of Desmond King. Yeah. Um, just, you know, how fluid he is on the field, um, you know, can, can run all over the place. And when he gets that ball in his hands, 
looks very natural with it. So um, when you have a relentless pass rush like the Chargers have, and then you have that secondary that with guys that have really good hands and are and are good enough in the cover game that when the ball is around them, they can make those anticipatory moves and, and get the ball away from the offense and, and really wreak havoc back there. Um, it really is a win-win situation. So for Tillery and Adderley coming into those specific position groups will, I think, help them thrive and thrive early. You know, in talking to Nazir Adderley's college coach, Danny Rocco from Delaware, he kind of echoed what you said in terms of getting the ball. You know, it's one thing to get off the field on third down, but when you have guys that can get the football like an Adderley, you know, you add a, a guy like Desmond King to the mix who's a ball hog, uh, Derwin, Casey Hayward. Um, it, it's one thing to get off the field on third down, but if you can turn the ball over, pass rush and in, in the secondary working together, um, that could be just a, an added layer to a team that, that won 12 games last year, did a lot of it without Joey Bosa, um, and could probably turn the ball over even more in 2019. Well, I think that's what separates the good teams from the great ones or even the great ones from the dominant ones is how frequently they're able to turn the football over and give the offense a short field. We know that the Chargers are going to be good next year. Let's make no bones about it. I know they don't want to get ahead of themselves, but they're, they're as talented as they come in the NFL. Coach Lynn and his staff have, have put, put in, in place a well-oiled machine. And I think in hearing – Philip Rivers talked earlier this week, you know, the big picture, they know what they're doing at every stop of the NFL calendar, where they need to be at in these OTAs and the workouts and in the training camp and all that. Now it's to focus on those details. Uh, he said that, you know, with, with coach Lynn and his staff and, and some of those details are, you know, making sure that not only do they get off on third down consistently, but they get the ball back and, and give Rivers and that offensive a short field. And, and it's, it's cliche at this point, but that complimentary football to really live it are those teams that you see go deep in the playoffs consistently. And I think the Chargers having that taste of a deep playoff run last year and, and being left short um, of that AFC championship game will only further motivate them in, into 2019. Yeah, and Phillip talked about the, just the need to having to, to start over. You know, The wins and losses don't carry over from year to year. Um, which kind of leads me to, to just the AFC in general and just your forecast of it now that we've seen the draft end and, and we kind of see where a lot of these teams are. You know, it's a lot of the usual suspects or some teams like Cleveland, uh, the Jets that are getting some buzz. Uh, how do you forecast the AFC recognizing that it, it's May 8th as we take this? Well, I, I would say just from the Chargers' perspective, they're in as good a position as anyone, and, and I know – you know, like Philip said, those wins and everything don't carry over, but but personnel does, and and the chemistry and camaraderie that that team has formed certainly counts for something. And when you look across the AFC landscape, a team like the Patriots that you you figure is going to be there with with Brady and Belichick, but sure. but guys like Trey Flowers leaving and and Rob Gronkowski now retiring, a lot of questions to be answered in New England, and they they seem to always find the answer, but but they'll still have to address. Look at Kansas City, all the turnover they've had there with, with their big-time defensive players like Barry and Houston uh, now gone. We'll have to see how Frank Clark fits in, fits in there. And the questions surrounding Tyreek Hill will be an issue in Kansas City, um, at least here in the foreseeable future. And, and you look at some of the other powerhouses in the AFC, similar questions. So when you look at that entire landscape of all the teams that you would think would have the big-picture run that, that had success last year, the Chargers seem to be the, the most consistently uh, performing in terms of, you know, how the offseason has unfolded. And, and, of course, you mentioned the Browns as well. As talented as they come, they still have to put it all together. We haven't seen any um, idea how, how that will kind of unfold. So you know, a lot of questions to be answered, a lot of talented teams out there. And, you know, the, the Chargers are, are, have just as much as say, I think when it's all said and done, as anybody out there. You know, I do think there's something to be said about having a quieter offseason because usually the teams that have the quiet offseason usually have a, a lot of things in place that can propel them to, to greater heights in 2019. You know, we talk about like the Browns, for instance, and listen, they're a better team uh, probably in, in year two of Baker Mayfield. You get Odell Beckham. Odell Beckham says they want to be the Patriots. I, I don't think they've won that division in three decades, Omar, so <laughs> I think they're going to have a ways to go, but certainly an, intri an intriguing team. And then the Jets, too. You know, you get Le'Veon Bell and, and Sam Darnold in year two. Perhaps that's another team that we, we typically don't see at the top of this conference that, that can make some noise. 
Yeah, and you, you throw in C.J. Mosley in the mix there, the Jets on defense, and, and yeah, there's a lot of talent that's been assembled, and, and you know, going back to Odell and the, being the Patriots, the excitement is at an all-time high in Cleveland, and we have yet to kick off, um, you know, a, a snap in the 2019 season, and I can tell you that, you know, there, there is a euphoria there that is very Super Bowl-like, uh, having been to cities shortly after they've won the Super Bowl. So, um, you know, they are probably getting ahead of themselves in Cleveland, at least from, you know, a fan base and a hype and an excitement perspective. But, you know, Freddie Kitchens can, can get the team to focus in and do the work that's required to celebrate later, then, you know, that's all, that's all possible. It's not excitement and optimism and, and, you know, newfound hope aren't bad things as long as the team, you know, doesn't necessarily get carried away with their own headlines and put in the work. So, yeah, there's a lot of new faces, new teams, new hopes, new excitement. You, you look at the Steelers, Chris, and all the turnover that they've had. Yeah. But they're the Steelers. Exactly. You know, they've been successful for, for 45 years, and, and there's a reason for that. So the investment that they've made in Ben Roethlisberger to come back um, for, for next year and beyond um, as a foundational piece for that team and, and the success that they have always seemed to have will, will, will likely – have us believing that in, in December that Pittsburgh will be a factor once again with all the other teams that we've just mentioned. It's very possible, Mar, that everybody could be underestimating what the Steelers do in, in 2019. And it's easy to when you lose a guy like Antonio Brown, and I know Le'Veon Bell didn't play last year, but w- with him gone, it, it's easy to say, oh, this is a team that, that's on the decline. But you said it, when you have a franchise that's consistently done it, and have a Super Bowl quarterback under center that can still play, uh, a lot of things are possible. And the Chargers are going to see them on Sunday Night Football in Los Angeles this year, so that should be fun. Uh, AFC West-wise, we, we talked about the Raiders, just a lot, of, a lot of new guys, not only in the draft, but they signed a lot of free agents. Kansas City is in transition a little bit on defense, but having Patrick Mahomes under center for the next decade plus, you know they're going to be a factor. Uh, one of the teams we didn't talk about is Denver. Uh, with Joe Flacco under center now drew Locke backing him up and just having a new coach and some new players in that program what do you make of the denver broncos in 2019 well i'm a big big fan joe fan you know ever since he he helped turn around the 49ers as quickly as they did with jim harbaugh there as the head coach and Vic, of course was the architect of that defense with patrick willis and navarro bowman and justin smith and and, and the rest of that talented front he really had them playing at a high level and and Success has followed wherever Vic has been uh, in the NFL, obviously uh, taking the Bears to the playoffs last year and, and being a part of that turnaround as well. So, um, you know, I, I like him as a head coach. So it all, it all starts from the top. And then you look at, you know, the <laughs> Bradley Chubb and, and Von Miller and what a formidable duo that's become. Then you throw, you know, Draymond Jones in there from Ohio State. Very similar situation to, to Tillery fitting in with some great pass rushers on the edge. Uh, here with the Chargers, so you know you have a similar situation there. And then you have, you know, Chris Harris looking to get a new contract. They can work that out and bring him back and and continue to to remake that. You know, you 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 would think that the defense would be at a point where it can play well enough that if Joe Flacco can find a resurgence in his career, that that could be a very talented team. And I think you look at Joe Flacco's best years. Really, he started to decline when Dennis Pitta got hurt. And, you know, having that dynamic tight end in the lineup is something that really, you know, sort of was a trickle-down effect to the lack of Joe Flacco being a productive right. high-level quarterback. They drafted Noah Fant now, and, and you know, having that dynamic tight end, um, if, if Fant can work out, because the Broncos have, have drafted, you know, several tight ends high in the, in the draft in, in several past years, but Fant seems to be a different maker. If he can be a contributor right away to go along with Emmanuel Sanders and, and the rest of that talent, that they drafted last year as receivers. And you're looking at a really complete roster to put it all together. But, but Chris, you know, like we talked about with a lot of these teams, those are a lot of questions to be answered. Not to say that, uh, that, that Vic Fangio can't get it all done, but there's still a lot of ifs, you know, he gets the Broncos back playing at a, a AFC West champion caliber. Yeah, AFC West going to be a, a very difficult division this year. Uh, final thing for you, Omar, now that the draft is over, I, I think we may be seeing an uptick in, in free agency. Uh, a lot of veterans still out there from Eric Berry to Ziggy Ansa to Ndamukong Su. Um, and just the, I guess the Cliff Notes version of this, the compensatory pick formula, 
starting today, May 8th. Compensatory picks don't factor in uh, when it comes to signing free agents now. Uh, do you think we'll, we'll start to see a, a little bit of a, an uptick over the next week or two? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, you know, bet the farm on it because, you know, I think, you know, agents um, and and general managers kind of know, obviously, today's date and the compensatory formula. So the longer teams can wait out, then I think the the lower the price will be for some of these kind of big name free agents. So um, the ones that will have a market, you'll you'll see get picked up quickly. Um, And the ones that don't, we might they might want to wait till we see what the needs are for training camp and, and whatever injuries might unfold um you know as as the year progresses heading toward the season so um it's certainly an interesting day on the calendar that's for sure you know and and how important teams have have given these compensatory picks uh over the years and how that's all developed in teams calculations and how they budget you know the for the salary cap and and everything else so um it'll be interesting to see what you know so many teams with so many holes still left on their rosters how quickly um, some of these veteran free agents are, are picked upon. And especially once you get these rookies in camp and you get a chance to see what they could really do. Yep. I think a lot of the time teams will see that these draft picks that they just made, uh-oh, maybe it was a mistake. Let's go get a veteran to fill that need. But giving those draft picks a, a shot first. So uh, intriguing time of year. It never it never is not, right, Chris? I was just going to um, say. The NFL, there's, there's always some question to be answered. Um, May is no different. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this weekend, rookie minicamp, like you said, it, it could dictate what happens over the next two, three, four weeks. So um, it, it's never a dull moment. Omar Ruiz, NFL Network, it's always a pleasure catching up with you, my friend, and I uh, hope to see you in Costa Mesa very shortly. All right, buddy. Always a pleasure, Chris. Uh, Anytime. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And that's going to do it. My thanks to Omar Ruiz, Matt Entz, and Chris Kleiman for joining me. And of course, thanks to you all for listening. Don't forget, if you like what you hear this offseason, be sure to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Please help spread the word. Have a great rest of the week. And until next time, I'm Chris Harey.